Well, thank you for coming. We have a very rare, very unique opportunity uh, to hear the greatest living Polish poet, uh, Adam Zagajewski. We are delighted that in his busy schedule he found the time to visit with us. Uh, so this is the way we'll proceed today. Uh, I will introduce Adam in just a second. Then I will uh, move on uh, to a few questions. After those questions, Adam will read some of his poetry, following which we'll have Q&A. And then we'll keep that rhythm for the rest of the meeting. I will again ask several questions, then he will do some reading, then we'll do Q&A. We are not going to wait with all the uh, questions and answers until the very end. I know that some people can come, go, they have to leave, so this is the way we will handle it. So Adam Zagajewski is a poet and an essayist. He was born in 1945 in Lvov, which is now part of uh, Western Ukraine. He grew up in Gliwice, which is in southern Poland. In 1963, he moved to Krakow, where he studied at the oldest Polish university, Jagiellonian University. In the late uh, 70s, he was an active dissident and took part in uh, all the activities of oppositional literary movement. In 1979, however, he was awarded a special fellowship uh, by International Kuntels Program and uh, spent two years uh, in Berlin. In 1982, Adam moved to Paris, where he continued to live for two decades. In 2002, he returned to Krakow, where he now continues to reside. While in Paris, uh, he was a member of the editorial board of the most prominent literary emigre magazine, Zeszyty Literackie. In the spring of 1988, Adam started teaching career uh, here in the United States. First, he started teaching uh, uh, at the University of Houston, a part of their creative writing program, and then in 2007 became a member of the Committee on Social Thought at the University of Chicago, which means that he teaches literature uh, one quarter a year at that university. Adam has been awarded numerous uh, prizes, uh, some of which include Neustadt Prize in 2004, the European Prize for Poetry in 2010, Jean Kuhn International Poetry Prize in 2013, Heinrich Mann Prize uh, Award in 2015, and just, uh, what, 72 hours ago, uh, you were awarded another prize in Washington, D.C. The no, most... No, 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 no prize oh, in Washington. No prizes. Oh, I'm sorry. Sometimes I don't get the prize. <laughs> <laughs> they just want to see you, and that's all. <laughs> it was just a reading, yeah. Well, just like at St. Cloud State. Yeah, let's not exaggerate. Okay. <laughs> Adam's most recent <coughs> book is entitled Unseen Hand, and it's a collection of his poems. So, shall we start? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, Adam, I will start with hopefully an easy question, but who knows, uh, how did you become a poet? And what did your parents say? <clears throat> oh, I didn't tell my parents for a long time. I was, I was very discreet with my writing. I was ashamed of it. My father, a wonderful man, was an engineer with, who was a avid reader, not so much poetry, but he, he, he loved reading novels and history. Um, and yet, um, when he was a, a professor at an engineering college in Silesia, and he couldn't imagine myself doing something else than becoming an engineer and <laughs> teaching in an engineering college later on. So when I was 18 or 17, I, I had to, to uh, wage a war against my parents who wanted me to go to this 
engineering school. And I said, no. I didn't tell them that I, I would be a writer because this, they, they, would, they wouldn't understand. And they would tell me, do you want to die in poverty? Do, uh, you know, this is what, in, what engineers think of, of writers, that they mostly die in poverty. Um, but the question, the main question, uh, how do you, how did I become a, a part? Well, I, it's hard, to, I, you know, when I was a boy, when I was 12, 11, 12, I loved reading books, so it came from reading, from my, the, the city where I grew up was not very attractive, I mean, it was not, it was a provincial place, and books were the, the, the best thing to in the city, and I read everything I could. And while reading these books, I told myself, oh, you have to be a writer. What's better than to be a writer? <coughs> Although, you, um, I don't know whether there's anyone who has had the same thing. When I was very young, when I was a child, I thought that all the writers were dead. Because, you know, you read, <coughs> I read James Fenimore Cooper, I read Dickens, I, and they were dead. So I, I, I concluded that the definition of a writer is this, someone who's dead. And then one day there was a, 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 a meeting with a living writer. I couldn't understand how, how, how come a living writer doesn't exist. So, but and now I understand there are some living writers after all. Uh, <clears throat> so my decision to be a writer was a kind of contradictory because on the one hand I thought that they were all dead and, and I wanted to be a living one, not a dead one. Uh, and then at, at the first, uh, at first I thought I would be a novelist because I, I knew nothing about poetry or very little. Uh, so when I was maybe 18, 19, I started to write some short stories. But I never liked them. I knew that they were, they were not so great. And, uh, and then one, one day, <coughs> or, or rather one night, I had this kind of mystic, almost a mystical experience. I, I, I wrote several poems during the night. I couldn't sleep. I was excited, intoxicated with my poems. They were not good. They were never published. And I, I hope they, they are lost somewhere. I don't even know. But at least this told me that writing poems is, is a kind of very emotional experience. It, it's not like writing a report or, or writing a school essay. It's, it engages your entire being. You, you, you have this moment of happiness and a moment of doubt and again happiness. And it's very deep. It's very emotional, and it, it, it gave me this taste of what writing can be. And of course I didn't, uh, I, I was not able to do this, to, re, to, to find again the same emotion every time, but at least I got the, this, the foretaste of w what writing can amount to. Uh, and then I still continued to, to write some prose. I, um, and I even published two novels, and, but I am not very proud of them, and I wouldn't recommend them to you, because um, uh, pretty soon I knew that my poems were stronger, that I, will, I had more to say in, 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 in poetry. So slowly, slowly I, uh, I started to publish. And the, the first poem, this, this may interest you, you, you know who Wisława Szymborska is, uh, this uh, Nobel Prize winner, the Polish poet, a wonderful lady who later became my friend. Um, and so when I was very young, she was running, a, a, she was a poetry editor for a popular, or more or less popular, literary magazine in Krakow. And she was the first person I went to with my poems, as you know, young poet trembling, uh, very shy, and, and I gave her my poems, and she said, okay, so please come back four days from now, and I will tell you. And I returned after four days, and she said, you know, 
it's not bad, but you better work more. You, I'm, so far, I'm not taking any of these for publication, but please come back after a few months. And then when, <clears throat> after a few months, of course I came back with new poems, and she took one of them, and this was my debut in, under the wings of Szymborska. But later, when we became friends, when I was a, a publishing poet, and I would ask her, do you remember my visit? She said, I'm so sorry, Adam, I don't. So you think that <laughs> that was my great, great uh, uh, disappointment. And she, she didn't remember my, what was so important for me, but she received every day maybe 10 young poets, so, so she didn't register this, this thing. So, and then, you know, then I, this, this was the beginning, and, um, but, but I think this answers your question. But let's carry on. Uh, how old were you at the time when you debuted officially? Well, when she published, I mean, when this magazine, this weekly published my poem, I was 22. So this, this was the beginning. And me. what were you studying? You were uh, obviously not at the School of Engineering. No, luckily not. No, I, uh, I was studying then um, uh, philosophy and psychology in Krakow. I went, I, as you said, I, mm -hmm. I left this provincial city of Gliwice which I still consider a very boring place. And, um, although th this is just an anecdote, but once, many years l later, but not when I was still pretty young, and uh, I heard uh, there was some student who so sang a, a song, and the song went like this, beautiful is Paris, beautiful is Rome, but the most beautiful city is Gliwice, <laughs> which, I didn't believe it at all. So. Uh, anyway, but what's really beautiful is Krakow. Krakow is, is the city where um, I, I, my college was when I, I studied and where I now live. And it's, a, it's really an, an, an amazing city. It was a medieval past, medieval old town, and, and still very much alive. It has also its modern part. So yeah, I studied philosophy and psychology, but not really, I didn't want to be a psychologist or a philosopher. I knew that I was a writer, so I, but I still kept it secret. But of course, when I started to publish, I couldn't keep my secret. <laughs> that's, the, that's another paradox of writing, right? That you cannot be a discreet writer because once you publish, you stop being discreet. I can tell you that earlier today I showed Adam a copy of one of those two novels that he isn't particularly proud of, so I guess I have a collector's item. I didn't you, know. You do, you do. Thank yes. you. I'll buy it from you for $100,000. Wow. $100, As a starting offer, right? <laughs> now. <laughs> Obviously, uh, and I remember it very well, uh, that particular novel was published in 1975, which means yes. that you started publishing under the communist rule, and obviously your writing was subjected to censorship. Yes. Could you kind of <coughs> tell us uh, how it worked and how it, if at all, affected your writing? <clears throat> yeah, with pleasure. You, you know. Uh, well, has the, you know, we, we, if we talk about these things, Poland was lucky because it, in other communist countries, um, there was the uh, the writers were subjected to the aesthetic doctrine of the party, which was called the socialist realism. Uh, I think it's very hard for an American person to understand that you can live in a country which has a kind of official aesthetic doctrine. Um, but it was the case in, in the Soviet Union, in East Germany, in Czechoslovakia, and, and, uh, you name it, in all the East Bloc countries, they had the rules, aesthetic rules. It was not only that you couldn't, for example, I don't know, criticize the party and the, the system. The Communist Party. The, the com yeah, it was the only one party, the, the Communist Party. 
but also you had to follow the aesthetic rules and you have to write a kind of down-to-earth realistic prose praising the country in which you live. But l for unknown reasons, Poland was an exception. So there was no aesthetic doctrine. You could write as a surrealist, you could write... There was a free, an aesthetic freedom, which for a, you know, for a farmer, it didn't mean much. Yeah, for for, for a, a, doc, a medicine doctor, it didn't mean much. But for a writer, for artist, it meant a lot. It was a, a free country in, this, in one respect, in the aesthetic respect. You could write whatever and however you wished to. You were still, the book still went to the censorship, but the censorship was interested in, are you attacking the first secretary of the communist country? Are you critical of, of communists in general? But, uh, but you could be critical of some minor phenomena, but not, not of the major phenomenon of, the, of communism. Uh, so uh, it, to be uh, subjected to censorship, censorship was not very pleasant. But it was not as terrible as it could seem now, uh, because uh, there was still uh, some some freedom of the freedom, some limited but uh, uh, existing freedom of expression. And by the way, when young, I I, I pretty quickly understood that even this limited censorship was something scandalous that human mind shouldn't be censored. And uh, very soon I joined this mov the movement of political movement, which was against not only censorship, but against the, the other totalitarian aspects of this society. So very early on, <coughs> I published several books uh, under censorship, but starting with mid-70s, so right after the, this novel, uh, I began to publish in the underground, which was, of course, free from the censorship. Mm -hmm. Now, I've read many stories about artists actually having to negotiate with censors, going to appointments and meeting an actual censor, mm -hmm. and then bargaining and so on and so forth. Have you ever had any of such experiences or not really? Once, yes, is when my first collection of poems was about to appear, um, the censorship was, uh, uh, they said, oh, no, we, we, we don't allow you two or three poems, they, they go too far. And, <clears throat> and I went with, I didn't go by myself because I had no political uh, uh, you know, experience and I, uh, but I had a, a, an older friend who was a, a very a strange guy who was sort of between the party and the he was a writer but with connections to the party and he was a kind of middleman between writers and, and, the, and the party and the censorship and he went with me, we visited the office of the censorship and I even wrote a poem about the censorship after this visit but what I, I was struck I, you know, I was a little bit uh, uh, I was panicking. I thought, well, the censor must be something terrible, like the like kind of medieval inquisition office with, uh, with whips on the, on the wall. And, 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 but actually, was a, there, there were nice people smiling. There was this smell of coffee. And, and oh, the censor is, is nice. Of course, I still knew. I still knew that the, the, what the function of the censorship was. And um, the bargain, uh, actually they, they, didn't, they still didn't allow, maybe I, I was able to save one poem, or, but there were two or three poems that they so, said, no, no, it's, it, you go too far. So. Mm -hmm. so it would be an entire poem uh, rather than a line or two? There were some lines, too, yes, but uh, also, uh, 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 the entire poems. Okay. <coughs> now, Adam, uh, as I read, uh, uh, you left Poland in 1982 and you lived abroad for 20 years. Mm -hmm. So you, thus you became an emigre poet. How did it feel for you as a writer and as a poet? Did you feel like you were mm -hmm. out of your element? Did you 
even try to write anything in French? No, 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 I didn't. I didn't write. I, I wrote maybe two short essays <coughs> in French. Um, well, I was not a good emigre. I mean, uh, if you if you know Polish history and you don't need to to know it, but we are very good in emig at emigration because we have this very strong tradition of uh, <coughs> our great poets, the 19th century poets, lived in Paris too. Mickiewicz, Słowacki, Chopin, who was not a poet but, as you know, a composer, a great composer. They all knew each other. <coughs> they, 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 they were like a community of, <coughs> excuse me, of, of emigre uh, artists. And they, they were a part of the artistic Paris then. Like, for example, Chopin was a great friend with Delacroix, who is the great French painter. And if you read, Delacroix left not only his paintings, but also a wonderful diary. And uh, there are many descriptions of his me He loved Chopin. Chopin was his great, great <coughs> friend. And so there was this one, Paris was an amazing, I know it's not the subject of our conversation, but I love this, you know, I love thinking of Paris in the, in the first half of the 19th century. It was filled with emigres coming from Poland, from Italy. You know, Italy was not yet independent. Uh, pe people like Mazzini, Garibaldi spent some time in, in Paris. Also, there was some Ge Heinrich, Heinrich Heine, the great German poet, lived, lived and died in Paris. And they all knew each other. It was a fantastic city. You know, there was this kind of community of, of poets and writers and the, the local, the, the great local, uh, 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 writers and artists mixed up with the exile. There was no dividing line between the the Parisian artists and the emigre um, artists. Uh, I say it because you know when I came to Paris in uh, in the late 20th century, I still remember the other Paris, and, which didn't exist. There was no tr no trace. If you forget about the plaque, some in many on many houses in Paris, you have a plaque. Here lived Heinrich Heine, or here lived Delacroix, here lived Chopin. Um, uh, and it, but there is this kind of tradition in, in the Polish uh, intellectual lives that to be an emigre is not a disaster. That to be an emigre means you have to work. It's it, it's one it's a, one of the conditions of an artist of a writer, it, which is, it's not the end of the world. You don't need to be silent. You don't need to despair. You write. You, you work, and then you, one day uh, or another, your work will find a, a way to your to, to the audience, to the, to, to the public. Uh, so I was. Um, it's interesting that you know if you if you look at the Amy Grace from other Eastern European countries, for example, from from Czechoslovakia. Well, Kundera is a great. A, Exception. He was so successful uh, as an emigre writer, but writers from other countries, uh, even Russian emigres, and uh, again, forget Nabokov, who, 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 who was in this country, right? But um, I think it was easier, in a way, for a Polish emigre to live abroad because there was this tradition that it, emigration is not. A, a total catastrophe, but it's it's one of the possibilities. And were those years prolific in terms of what you wrote for you? Well, I don't know whether prolific is good. Yeah, good. For me. I was, <clears throat> I, yes, yes. I, you know, it's very hard to praise yourself. But I, I, will, I cannot say. But uh, um, the eighties, uh, but also the nineties were were good for for my writing. I, I loved this. In a way, I like solitude. You know, I, I published then <coughs> in mid '80s. As you, if you know a, a little bit about Polish history, this was the time of Solidarność, the Solidarity Movement with Valencia, and, and then the martial law, which sort of ended abruptly the, the flowering of the of the Solidarność Movement. And in in Paris, I published a book. Uh, an essay called Solidarity Solitude, in which I defended, I was not against Solidarność or Solidarity, 
not at all, but I, I tried to, to defend also solitude, that a country cannot thrive on solidarność alone. It has to have there are two wings. One is the, to being together, being a strong community, but art and literature and, and every domain of human mind uh, requires solitude as well. So I was defending this other pole of human activity. The book was not so well received in Poland. My friends <laughs> told me, are you crazy? We have, we have to, f you know, to finish up communism. We have to kill communism. And, and you want us to be, to be solitary. We have to be uh, solidary. But some people love this book. And I still think it, it was a, uh, it, it had some place in, in the debates, in the intellectual debates of the time. <coughs> Adam, uh, you started talking about your working process, and I would like to ask this question before you read your poetry and we hear some of the questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. How do you work? Do you have, as some essays do, working days, like Thursdays, Fridays? Mm -hmm. Uh, do you wait for any inspiration? Are you at all concerned that you may sort of uh, hit the proverbial wall? Uh, how does that work? Or, uh, is, is poets work more inspiration or perspiration? Mm. Well, it's both, it's both. But there's no perspiration without inspiration in, in poetry. Uh, well, I, you know, I'm, I've been writing for many years and writing became my second nature. I need it for my... <clears throat> it's, you know, when you write, and I will tell you just in how many days a week I try to... <laughs> when you write and you have this moment of pleasure with your writing, then it's like a chemical process, like you feel purified, like you feel something... You've saved the day, you, you've saved this, the day, and it's... So uh, I'm very happy when I am able to write. I'm not able to write every day, uh, unfortunately. It's good for the mankind because I don't produce too many books. So. But um, uh, from from <coughs> my point of view, it's it's for I think for every writer the regular writing is the key to to kind of uh, sanity uh, because the writing is like fighting against possible insanity. I, I must say I never had problems with, real problems with insanity, but who knows if I ha haven't been writing, who, who knows. Um, well, it's impossible to write poems every day, simply impossible, because this is really kind of inspiration, this is something exceptional. But I write essays, I write, I, I'm a part of the literary uh, life, and I, I write sometimes, uh, I'm being often asked to write a preface to a book or a <coughs> an afterword to a book. Uh, whenever I get a prize, and I didn't get one in Washington, so <laughs> I, I, I repeat, um, uh, whenever I get a prize, I'm, I'm asked to write a, a, a speech when, in which I, I express my, my gratitude for the prize, and it all this takes time, and I always try to make it well. So it's not just a piece of of so-so writing, but it's a real writing. Uh, right now, I, uh, you mentioned this Heinrich Mann prize. You know, Heinrich Mann was the brother of Thomas, right? There, was these, there were these two famous German writers, Thomas Mann, and <coughs> who was much more famous and his less, less known brother Heinrich, who also was a very good writer. And so now this prize is, I will receive it uh, a week from tomorrow in Berlin, and I, I've just finished writing an essay in which I, I express my, you know, it was very hard for me because I prefer Thomas to Heinrich, so I had, <laughs> <coughs> I had, I had to, well, I read some of Heinrich, but I read almost everything by Thomas, and anyway. So I try, I, you know, when you have my age, which is not, which is ad advanced, and um, when you have some 
uh, some presence in the world of literature, you're always being asked to write this preface, please, help us with this book. So the problem is rather to say no, you know, because there are too many of these this uh, uh, requirement is, uh, but it gives me at least it gives me possibility to, to w not to waste any day. Mm -hmm. Adam, uh, do you do what some musicians do uh, that uh, at a certain point they take a second look uh, and they change their compositions? Uh, uh, sometimes just simply making a cut, like Mahler did with his first symphony. So my question for you is, do you ever make any corrections, or do you find yourself thinking, oh, I wish I had written it this way, uh, or do you ever make any changes? Mm -hmm. Well, yes, I do, but mostly, uh, sometimes I do in a very radical way, and it sometimes it takes many weeks. Although it doesn't mean that I'm then sitting over a poem for five weeks because it would kill <coughs> the freshness of this poem. But w if I write a, a, a poem and it's usually, if it goes well, I write sometimes 10 or 12 versions, one after another. So it's it's a constant process of revision. It's it's not so that I write the first versions and I go to have a lunch. No, mm -hmm. I, I, it's a constant, constant work. It's, it's uh, sometimes there are twenty versions of, of a single poem, but then it comes one after another. It's not so that I wait five weeks. Mm -hmm. it, the, the, the same, the same day I can have five versions, and then the next day I, I'm still not content, and I. I mm -hmm. <coughs> so yeah, it's a lot of, of revision. But when the poem is read, such as in your collection, do you make any changes? No, no. Ten so years no, later, no, 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 I, no. Okay. I'm not like this wonderful painter Bonnard, who was, you know, the French painter, but who was famous that he would go to the gallery where they were showing his work, uh, and he with a brush, and he would still uh, uh, make revisions. And I don't do this. No. Okay, now would you be so kind and read some of your poetry for us, please? Sure, if you are patient enough. <laughs> so maybe a few poems from this, this was the uh, uh, Without End, selected poems. Oh, you you mentioned music. I, I have several poems that handle that, that deal with music. This is a poem on the cello. And the title is Cello. Those who don't like it say it's just a mutant violin that's been kicked out of the chorus. Not so. The cello has many secrets, but it never sobs, just sings in its low voice. Not everything turns into song, though. Sometimes you catch a murmur or a whisper. I'm lonely. I can't sleep. Uh, this is a poem I dedicated to Derek Walcott, you know, the wonderful poem from St. Lucia, <clears throat> because he dedicated a poem to me, and I, uh, this was kind of a, a gift uh, for him. And I, I thought I need the word ocean, because Derek Walcott is all about ocean. Um, but so you'll see. Um, it's called The Room I Work In. The room I work in is as four square as half a pair of dice. It holds a wooden table with a stubborn peasant's profile, a sluggish armchair, and a teapot's pouting 
Habsburg lip. You know the Habsburgs, the Austrians, they, had, they were famous for this protruding lip. <clears throat> From the window I see a few skinny trees, wispy clouds, and toddlers always happy and loud. Sometimes a windshield glints in the distance or higher up an airplane's silver husk. Clearly, others aren't wasting time while I work, seeking adventures on earth or in the air. The room I work in is a camera obscura. And what is my work? Waiting motionless, flipping pages, patient meditation, passivities not pleasing to that judge with the greedy gaze. I write as slowly as if I will live 200 years. I seek images that don't exist. And if they do, they're crumpled and concealed like summer clothes in winter, when frost stings the mouth. <coughs> I dream of perfect concentration. <clears throat> if I found it, I would surely stop breathing. Maybe it's good I get so little done. But after all, I hear the first snow hissing, the frail melody of daylight, and the city's gloomy rumble. I drink from a small spring. My thirst exceeds the ocean. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> maybe not. There's a poem <clears throat> which I wrote in Houston. It's like has, it's called Houston, six p.m. And my friends from Houston don't like it because they they, they misunderstand one of the lines here. I, I, will I can tell you later. <clears throat> Houston, 6 p.m. Europe already sleeps beneath a coarse plaid of borders and ancient hatreds. France nestled up to Germany, <coughs> Bosnia in Serbia's arms, lonely Sicily in azure seas. It's every early evening here, the lamp is lit and the dark sun swiftly fades. I'm alone, I read a little, think a little, listen to a little music. I am where there is friendship but no friends, where enchantment grows without magic, where the dead laugh. I am alone because Europe is sleeping. My love sleeps in a tall house on the outskirts of Paris. In Krakow and Paris, my friends wait in the same river of oblivion. I read and think. In one poem I found the phrase, there are blows so terrible, don't ask. I don't. A helicopter breaks the evening quiet. Poetry calls us to a higher life, but what's low is just as eloquent, more plangent than Indo-European, stronger than my books and the records. There are no nightingales or blackbirds here with their sad, sweet cantilenas. Only the mockingbird who imitates and mimics every living voice. Poetry summons us to life, to courage, in the face of the growing shadow. Can you gaze calmly at the earth like the perfect astronaut? Out of harmless indolence, the grease of books and the Jerusalem of memory there suddenly appears the island of a poem, unpeopled, 
some new cook will discover it one day. Europe is already sleeping. Night's animals, mournful and rapacious, move in for the kill. Soon America will be sleeping too. Okay, so my friends from Houston, <coughs> they don't like these two lines. I am where there is friendship, but no friends. And they think that I mean them. <laughs> but it's not true. <coughs> it's not true. I, don't, I really have and had and still have good friends in Houston. What I mean is that, you know, when you are, when you are deeply sung in reading and, and or when you listen to music, uh, it is a kind of friendship with those who created this music, this, these books. Uh, but the, most of these are dead. You know, it's like my child, uh, my, my my childish convictions that all the authors are dead. So many are, and many composers are. So th this is what I mean. There are no friends because they are gone, and yet they give us so much. Even so, <clears throat> and the blackbirds. You might, you could ask me why we have blackbirds, here. but you know the European European blackbirds are different, and they are great singers. I must say, your your blackbirds are not so great as <laughs> singers. I'm sorry to say. I know it can can be very unpleasant for you, but but truth is truth. Um. One more poem. This one is called Chinese Poem. I read a Chinese poem written a thousand years ago. The author talks about the rain that fell all night on the bamboo roof of his boat and the peace that finally settled in his heart. <coughs> is it just coincidence? that it's November again, with fog and a leaden twilight? Is it just chance that someone else is living? Poets attach great importance to prizes and success, but autumn after autumn tears leaves from the proud trees, and if anything remains, it's only the soft murmur of the rain in poems neither happy nor sad. Only purity can be seen, and evening, when both light and shadow forget us for a moment, bu busily shuffling mysteries. Okay, okay so let's move on to some uh, questions. Uh, we have a microphone, <coughs> so we can pass it around. Would anyone like to ask? Um, how do you think that the internet and social media have affected the well-being of poetry? Uh -huh. um. Um. Well, it's a, it's a very interesting question. I'm, you know, as, as you must know, uh, internet uh, has millions of poems, right? So, uh, internet actually provides a, a huge access to poetry, breaking the law, of course, because, you know, poets, living poets, uh, get no royalties for this. But I don't want to discuss legal matters. <laughs> uh, as such, internet, I, you know, it, it's maybe not the moment and the place to discuss internet in its entire global meaning. But for poetry, it has a good, good influence. Uh, you can find poems you, you look for. Uh, you know, there's, there are many young poets who publish their books on the poetry collections on internet, and yet um, uh, I think for many of them the, the dream is to have a real book, you know, not just the internet publication. 
So we, we live in a, in a double world, because the old world of paper is still very strong. If I'm not wrong, the statistics tell us that um, every year there are more books, more paper books being published. It's not a dwindling business. It's actually a growing business. So the e-books, the entire internet, uh, is not killing books uh, so far. We don't know what will happen 20 years from now on, or, or more. Uh, for, the, for the process of writing, for the imagination of poets, I don't think internet has any impact. It's not so that you, when you sit at your desk or you, you can sit at a bench, on a bench in a park and write a poem, you don't need to be in your room. I don't think that in, you, you think of internet in the moment of writing a poem. No, you don't. It, the, the, it's still the imagination, it's still the moment of, of emotion, and, and internet has no emotion, right? It's, it's, it's cold. Um, it can preserve some, it, it can, you know, store, it's like a storage of emotions. So, the, so to speak, the existential situation of, of a poet hasn't been changed by the modern media. Uh, the way the circulation of, of, of poems is concerned, it has changed, yes. But um, I don't think it's a, it's a fundamental change. I think other domains of human life has, have been more changed by internet than poetry. But can you make it more precise, the question? Um, Do you mean I was just, I'm just curious. I mean, when I hear you read, um, there's, it's, 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 and I, please don't take this wrong, it's because it's going to come out wrong. It's a very, it's a much older way of presenting poetry. Uh, the way po a lot of poetry is being done now is in a certain way done as more, more, more as theater. Uh, more what? Theater. Theater. Uh huh. Uh -huh. And I just, so you mean more aggressive, more? Yes. Uh, uh -huh. And I'd like to just, if you, if you're aware of it, what what your thoughts are on uh, the new wave, uh, a new wave of poets. Uh huh. Um, you mean slam poetry, anything like this? Well, it's a different world. It's not my world. You know, I, I am not. Uh, uh, I'm not opposed to it, I, I'm not uh, f fighting against it, but it's not my world. I remain faithful to, you know, to the old ways of, of being, of presenting my poems in a, in a kind of low-key way, and I, usually I find uh, people who are willing to, to come to my reading, so it's not, I don't feel abandoned by it audience, but also the verbal presentation actually for me is a tiny part of the existence of my poems. My poems exist in books and, you know, uh, again, I hate, you know, bragging, but my, my poems have been translated into some 25 languages and they exist in many countries. and. I am very modest in you know looking at it because I, my idea is in every country I have 500 readers, you know, not more, but but in many countries. So if if you make a calculation, it's still something. And this is the way poetry exists now. It's not it's not like Stephen King, you, you know. It's it's, it's not big circulations. But uh, to be present in more than 20 countries, to be present in China, to be present in, in India, to be present in, in the entire Anglo-Saxon world, to be present in, in many countries, for me it's, you know, of course it's soothing. It tells me, yeah, you, it's not f in vain what you do. It's not in vain. You have your readers. 
sometimes I give a reading um, in a country that I barely know, like, I don't know, I go to Slovenia or I go to, well, to China and, uh, or I go to Sweden and there's someone who tells me after the reading, you know, this poem of, you, of yours helped me to survive a very difficult moment in my life. And this is the highest praise that a poet can get, you know. And that there's always a said by a single person. It's never a crowd reciting, you have said. You know. It's always individual. It, it, poetry is addressed to individual readers, not to crowds. Uh, but even so, I, I you know, I, I, I'm glad that my poems do have a life, not only in my language, where I also have readers, of course. Uh, but in, in other languages, through translations. Uh, so the way I do it verbally, it's, it's maybe not decisive here. If I could follow up on what Mark asked about, would you then say that the theat theatrical presentation of poetry adds to it or takes away from it? Well, it depends what you mean. If you mean a slam poet or this kind of poetry, I think this poetry exists only in this in this aggressive way, and it's, it usually it cannot survive on the page, right? It's it's not so strong on the page. It is a a different art. It's the art of which which lasts in time. It is this this it's it's a it's an event. It's not. It's not literature in the old sense of the word. It's event. It, it happens, and then it's forgotten, or maybe not forgotten. But it, uh, so it's a totally different art. And I, you, you, you know, I, I'm not. I, I, I will not try to compete with with. I, I, I have respect for these people. I, I, I like it. I, I, I think it is something new and and, and tr but. I think it can be almost a definition of human culture that new invention and within the culture don't kill the other way, the older ways. Say, we live in a more a richer and richer culture with new ways of expression, but the old ways of expression still exist. Like you know, the the typewriter didn't kill the fountain pen. Maybe the computers killed the right the typewriters, but but <laughs> they still don't kill. The fountain pen. There's a new fashion for for writing with with a fountain pen. So, you know, poetry is the fountain pen. Um, I'm a is it on? Okay. Um, I'm a novelist, and I was wondering on the note of translated works, I kind of want to know if you think it loses anything because um, I study Spanish literature, and I know when reading works by Antonio Machado and um, Pablo Neruda and even the novels by Garcia Marquez and things like it is just very different when you read it in the original language and I think even almost the sound loses something when translated so I know your works you said have been translated into 25 different languages and do you think it kind of changes the meaning and things like that? Well it's a good question oh, well, well it changes the sound that's, that's for sure uh, I don't think it really changes the meaning. It may change minimally the, the meaning. Uh, you know, I'm a believer in translation. I, uh, I think that, per, that translation is, uh, is indispensable. Uh, we would be very poor spiritually had we to limit ourselves to our language. You know, uh, I always think of the Psalms, the, the biblical Psalms, which very few people read Hebrew, and yet the Psalms are, are uh, one of the peaks of the world poetry. Not many people read ancient Greek, and when you read Sappho, the great woman poet, she, she, she was such a wonderful poet, so we would be very poor if we had to renounce on, on translation. Of course, one has to be reasonable and to see that, yeah, you're right, there's kind of loss in it. There's always some, you lose something in translation. Uh, but, uh, the, you know, there are all kinds of trans the translators of genius, and there are bad translators, 
right? It's not the translator is not a, f a kind of universal figure. There are huge differences. There are very talented translators who manage to save as much as possible from the original. Uh, and their work is usually recognized and they are, they are cherished for, for this. And that the other ones who are, uh, you, you know, my, my wife is a psychologist and she reads plenty of psychology books and, and, and she, she uh, her best language is French, she speaks French fantastically. And she always, she reads some books translated from the French, psychology books, not literature. And she says, oh, these, these translations are so bad. So it happens in many fields, you know, that, that people are doing this translation uh, very quickly to make more money, to, to, which you can understand, you know, humanly speaking. But uh, the, the literary translation requires more, requires m more attention, <coughs> more respect for the original. And, and I think in every good literature, translations are simply, as I said, indispensable. We cannot live without them. Who can read Marcel Proust in French? Well, I can because I lived many years in France, but, but uh, many uh, uh, great works of, of literature would be, uh, uh, would have, you know, people would have no access to them. <coughs> if not for the translation. I, I, I'm a defender of the translation. Adam, if I could pick up, because this is exactly a, a bunch of questions that I wanted to bring up uh, about translation. Obviously, you speak French, uh, I presume German and English, so you can check the translation. How does that process work? Uh, you saw, is it you who handpicks a, a translator? or is it the publisher? Once the translation is completed, do you then have some kind of a conference discussing the uh, translation? Uh, how does that work? Uh, well, first of all, <clears throat> no, the, it's usually, you know, if, you, if we talk about poetry, it's, it's not a very commercial uh, business. So uh, translators are people who do it with love. They don't, usually they don't build their economic, you know, stability on translation. They have some other jobs or, um, so it's not, it's not a part of, uh, of a kind of uh, uh, business. Uh, and it, usually publishers, uh, they may help with it, but it's usually it goes, uh, usually has nothing to do with the publisher. It's, it, in this small world of poetry, Poets and translators are mostly friends. It, it, it's, it's built on friendship, on trust. And very often translators are poets themselves who do translations as a way of enlarging their, their project, so to speak. Uh, so, uh, and the trust, for me, is the main, is the cornerstone here, that you have to trust your translator. Uh, and your question you embarrasses me because I'm, m my friends, translators, always complain that I don't pay enough attention to, even in the languages I know. Like for my Swedish translator, I don't know Swedish, so he's happy in, that I, I don't really intervene. But even Claire Kavanagh, who is who's my, my translator into English, um, and. She t sometimes she asks me a question, but we don't work together. She's mm -hmm. she's so good. She doesn't need mm -hmm. me, and uh, I I do a kind of a fact checking, but but w whether she didn't confuse the the months of May with the months of September or something like that. But but <laughs> in the important things, she 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 doesn't need my help, and and besides, you know. It's, I, I think not just for me, but for many writers or poets, uh, the, translation, it, the translation always deals with something that's for you as an old hat, which you finished five years ago, two years ago. And I, I think almost every writer is uniquely interested in the new thing, in, the, in something that she, he or she is writing now. 
and this is the old hat, you know, it's the old hat. You know. So I'm not really uh, motivated to go back to my old poems and to, to check the translation because I have more important things to do. I believe you had a team of four translators, don't you? Into English at least. Well, no, now it's practically clear. It's the, just the, her alone. The other ones, uh, this was in the past, but, mm -hmm. you, you know, that, but right now it's, it's one person. Okay. Now, Adam, you talked uh, a little bit about writing prose, and I'm not referring here to writing a foreword or afterward to a publication, but how does your prose uh, complete your poetry? Do you mean my essays? Essays, right? yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Oh well, I, it's a very, it's a difficult question. Uh, uh, well, essays by nature are more, you have more space in an essay. You have to, essays are more um, built on on uh, erudition. You you include, uh, you you discuss with other writers. Poems are are more, of course, more lyrical, more personal, more, uh, there's less dialogue with others. Uh, there is a kind of dialogue, but maybe less, less manifest. So, uh, essays are, you know, every poet has some opinion, some point of view. <coughs> in, the, uh, you, in, in your poems, you don't express your opinions, never. You, you express your feelings, you express your, your emotions. But in your essays, you try to defend your positions, your, your quasi-philosophical position. Every poet is a kind of failed philosopher. And every philosopher is a failed poet. There's this kind of a reciprocal uh, relationship between poets. You know, if you, if, you, if you read about the history of philosophy, many philosophers tried to be poets first. And some poets try to be philosophers first. So there's this kind of failing. Oh, too bad. I'm not a poet. I'll be a philosopher. Or, or, or the vice versa. Mm -hmm. So there's, and, and essays, uh, and a, a poet who writes essays is returning to his philosophical vocation. Oh, I will defend some, an argument. I will tell you. Or, or some of them are, are autobiographical. So there's this narrative part. Essay is a very, flexible genre. It's kind of stands between narrative and reflection, between aphorism and and, and narration. Uh, so it, it, it like autobiographical essays have of course not much to do with philosophy. They, they are more narrative. They, they, they're a way of, of, of telling a story. But uh, earlier on you you didn't use the word but I will uh, you were referencing this kind of a getting on a writing high. Uh, do does essay writing uh, also give you as much of a high intoxication as poetry does, or is it something totally different? No, it has to give you some intoxication. Why to write if you are not intoxicated? <laughs> writing is about intoxication. Well, I'd say it's intoxication. Um, versus a reflection. A reflection mm -hmm. always controls you. You control your, your, you are not an addict, you know, you, you, you are not a junkie. You, you control your intoxication. Um, but yeah, the essay writing also has an element of, of, of uh, uh, euphoria sometimes. Mm -hmm. If you read an essay, you see that some fragments which are more intense, more emotional. The, the other ones are more uh, uh, and more expository, less less hot, and it's 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 the constant constant wave waving between the two. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Uh, Adam, writing uh, seems to me as a pretty lonely job. How how do you handle it? Uh, you already mm. talked about this solitude as a necessary component on, in one's life. Uh, is that uh, what is the main ingredient in writing? Or? No, I think writing is a perfect uh, middle point between solidarity and solitude. 
in terms of how, for example, if you ask me, I would, my days are uh, uh, constructed so that I, I try every day to, 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 to do some writing in the first half of the day. And in the second half of the day, I'm seeing my friends, I go out, I, and I love this, it, it's this kind of uh, a, a, a completion. One is completing the, the other. And also, when you write, you're solitary, but you, you know that it's for the others. You don't write for yourself, you, you write for someone else. Uh, so, uh, I, I, I don't think writing is autistic, you know. <laughs> it's solitary, but never autistic. Okay. Now, I'm, I'm sure that this is the question that many people would like to ask. It just maybe hasn't come to them, but what are some of your favorite writers? And among them, are there any <coughs> American writers? Uh-huh. Um, well, yeah, we have the dwindling audience, but I was still, <laughs> I was still, uh, be courageous and uh, uh, listen. Um, well, for, I have to tell, to say first of all that uh, I I've been very lucky as 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 a writer to be a part of a larger group of Polish poets. Uh, th those a phenomenon of. Uh, those of you who have interest in poetry know that Poland produced some of the greatest poets of the 20th century, with Czesław Miros, with Zbigniew Herbert, with Szymborska, the one who accepted my first poem, uh, and Tadeusz Różewicz. Uh, these poets are read everywhere, uh, and um, it's something unusual for a single country. I, I'm frequently asked the question, how come Poland has produced so many good poets in the recent uh, 70 years? And of course, there's no answer to this question. How, what can you say? Genes, we, we've got some g good genes. You never know why. <coughs> uh, to some extent, uh, you know, I, I met <clears throat> I, I met with someone I met before, but I, I, I saw a, a, a pastor in Washington now, where I got no prize. I, I <laughs> um, and you will, you will. <laughs> no, I don't think. So. And he he's a minister in the Episcopalian Church, and he's fascinated by Polish poetry. Uh, he once drove to one of my readings to New Jersey. There's many, a long, long ride. Now, he, since his parish is in Fairfax, Virginia, his, he didn't have so, so you know, the, so far he wasn't so far away from my, from my reading. And he told me something that's really, that, that surprised me. He said he's, he's thinking of a book. On a on a parallel between the Hebrew prophets and the Polish poetry, I find it absolutely fascinating. You know, because he says, uh, and he says, we, we had this long conversation in Washington on on, on Tuesday just before I came here, uh, and I said, well, but you know, the, the Hebrew prophets were very angry, Polish poets were not angry. He said, yeah, but you know, Isaiah, the Isaiah second, Isaiah two. Uh, was not an angry, not so angry prophet. And there's some really fascinating analogies. Like for, I thought before, even before having this conversation with him, I thought of, the, you, you, you know, if you, if you look at the history of Poland, you know that in 44, Warsaw, the capital, was totally erased by the Germans, by the Nazis, totally. There was almost no trace of the of the capital of Poland, and he said, "You see, this is like Jerusalem. The Hebrew prophets wrote after the destruction of Jerusalem of, of the temple, and that, that's a fascinating analogy. <laughs> you know. uh, it's a very flattering analogy for Polish poets, of course, because Hebrew prophets are like the great figures of humanity." But he, he's really fascinated by, by, by Milos, by, by Herbert, by, uh, by these poets. Um, 
So when you ask me about other writers, this is my family of, the, like the, my nearest family of writers, these great poets. And I was born a generation later, uh, but uh, I didn't reject them. I, I was one of those who tried to, in some way, in a personal way, in an individual, to continue what they did. Um, so this is my the direct family. These are the people that I really admire. And I knew uh, all of them. They, they were more or less my friends and my masters, and later also my, my friends. Uh, I cannot deny it, and I don't want to deny it. Don't, I don't see why should I deny it. So th this is my family, Th these, these great poets who, and what was the, gr you know, if you, even if you forget about this parallel with the Hebrew prophets, uh, why were they so important? Because in a way they, they, uh, they decided in some way, conscious or unconscious, to be more than poets, to speak to their people, to speak to their community, to express the fate of the Polish nation, but not in a in a way of someone who is, uh, you know, a party member. You said not nationalist. There's nothing nationalistic in the world. There's nothing chauvinistic. There's nothing. Uh, this kind of patriotic element, but that's that's you know there's nothing wrong with that. But they're also ironic, they're critical of their own nation, as the prophets were. So, you know, I'm I'm not able to forget this <laughs> this analogy as you see. Um, and because if you look at the world poetry, uh, it's very hard to find poets of the same kind, of poets who would uh, who would have this dialogue with their own community in such a strong way. Many of the great modernist poets, like, I don't know, Ezra Pound, like he, he's maybe a, a, a radical example with his all weird opinions on, with his anti-Semitism, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, well, T.S. Eliot had a community, a religious, more a religious community. That, so the uh, historical community, but Rilke, a very solitary poet, he's a great. I, you know, it's not c critique. It's I'm trying to, to you know, there's more uh, trying to 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 to, to define them, to understand. Them. So so like like in a way, the exemplary figure of a modernist figure is a uh, modernist poet is Rilke, the German poet, solitary wonderful poet, a poet of human existence, right, uh, reflecting on death, on, on the religion of our destiny, but very solitary, having no community at all. Now he has a huge community of readers in every country uh, uh, in the world. But, uh, but these Polish poets, they created something new, these strong ties with the community. I'm not saying that they were better than Rilke, it would be ridiculous. I, it's not like, you know, weighing their mm -hmm. the literary value, but the, the, the situation, the, the social situation. Uh, and so this is my model, and I'm, although I'm not maybe a little less social than they were, uh, but still I, I think I remain in the, in the, within the uh, the examples they, they gave. Tradition. The, yeah. Yes. <coughs> yeah, so that, uh, plus there are many other, you know, I, I, I read a lot, so there are many writers and poets who I adore. But but if you ask me this question, I must, I, I have to, first these, uh, mm -hmm. these Polish poets. So this is one more instance where communism repression had an unintended, extremely positive side effect, right? Well, the communists, but first the incredibly terrible Nazi occupation. Mm -hmm. You cannot forget this. This was, this was the six years of the most terrible time that, you know, un under the, the German occupation. 
uh, and the erasing of the capital, the dist destruction of Warsaw, what was the Nazi, mm -hmm. you know. Later came the communists. It was, uh, but actually, communists was for Poland a lesser evil than than the Nazis in terms of biological survival. Because, Annihilation. Uh, yeah. Because the Nazis uh, meant biological an annihilation. Sure. Now, Adam, there may be some aspiring poets, one or two, in the audience. What would be maybe five or so uh, recommendations, guidelines that you would give them? Uh, I once wrote an essay uh, under the title Young Poets Read All, and it was, uh, well, the idea was, um, I was asked, it was a part of an anthology. Uh, uh, edited by someone uh, for younger, po uh, sort of destined for, well, m maybe not only for the younger poets, but what poets should read. And I, and then I, I say that this is, a poet, a poet is a well-read person. You cannot write poetry not knowing uh, your predecessors. It, 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 alas, you know, it's a lot of work. Unless you like to read, and it's not a it's a pleasure, right? So it's not just it's not a torture. But um, so, so one is to read other poets. Yes, right? other poets, not only poets. Mm -hmm. not only, you know, I remember when I saw Szymborska <coughs> and, and as a young poet, and she gave me this advice. You know, you should read, but not only poetry. You should read everything, philosophy. So actually, I repeated her injunction in my later essay. She said you have to read um, philosophy, sociology, biology. She was very interested in biology mm -hmm. as well. Um, so yeah, you have to... This, this is the problem with the MFA programs in, in this country. So they're very uniquely oriented on poetry. And the young poets don't read anything else. They, they know nothing about poetry. They know nothing about, uh, about philosophy. They know nothing about biology. They know nothing about history of art, unless someone has a, a, you know, a strong interest, a kind of individual personal interest. They know a little about music, about the history of music. and. In a, in a way, you know, there's this Renaissance idea of what, what does it mean to be a poet. is this universal man, I mean, or universal human being, rather, man or woman. Uh, and this universality has to do with, with knowledge as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to read, and the second thing, you have to be patient, because you will not be recognized right away. It takes years. It, you, first you get rejection slips for years, and you have to be very strong innerly to, to withstand this. Mm -hmm. So patience and reading. And talent. Talent is not bad. <laughs> it's good to have talent. Uh, yeah, but you know, talent is something that you cannot, uh, you cannot artificially, <laughs> you have it or you, not, or, or you don't, right? Uh, so we don't talk about talent because it's, it, it's, it's obvious that you have to have this something that... <coughs> but with talent comes patience, I think, comes kind of strength, endurance, that you, you, you will be able to, to withstand these, these uh, uh, unpleasant moments when another rejection slips comes. Uh, I, in, the, a few weeks ago, one of my friends died, a, a wonderful poet from my generation, <coughs> who lived in, who was a professor at Harvard, whose name was Stanislav Barainter. And we had a, a, a kind of a ceremony in Krakow to, to, uh, uh, where we talked about him. Uh, and I remembered how the, how first I heard about his existence. We were both very young, we were 21, 22, maybe 23, I don't know, but still very young. And I sent one of my poems to a poetry contest. And uh, then I was awaiting with impatience the results. 
And finally the result was pub publicized. I don't remember how and how, how it was, but and he won the contest. I was not even mentioned. I said, oh, this is the way I learned about his existence. So these are the you know, the sufferings of a young poet that you you, you send out your <coughs> poems, but there's no echo, and, and everyone knows it. So, but then we became friends with him, and I think I never told him I, <laughs> the, how how the beginning was. Yeah. Sort of a, a one question with with two parts. What is your best source of inspiration? Uh, is it love, pain, nature, and what is uh, your biggest distraction? Uh, Distraction in terms of D distracting I you from writing. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, okay. Well, inspiration. I don't know. It it can be anything. I do actually. It's, I don't know. There's no way to define it. it. Can be a piece of music. It can can be a moment. It can be light of the setting sun. Uh, it, it it can be. No, sometimes it's just a line in a book, not necessarily a poem. Uh, sometimes you find some a sentence formulated by, by someone who's so, which is so strong, so wonderful that it it, that it gives you impulse to to continue to go to go further. So it it can come in in many ways, many ways. It's not a single mm -hmm. single. And the distraction, I mean, you mean in a positive way or a negative way? Well, that it takes you away from writing. It, it's a but in a good way, so to you have a rest, or in a bad way? That it well, let's do both. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know that the biggest distraction in a negative sense is simply you cannot concentrate. There are days it's hard to concentrate because writing arises from concentration, of course, not, not from... Uh, the lack thereof. Um, and the good distraction is, you know, swimming, walking, uh, mm -hmm. going to a museum, spending time with your wife. Earlier today, we were looking at the, at the picture of Borges, and I remember when he famously said, <coughs> "Who lost sight? I believe in his late." or so, but at any rate, uh, no, when he, he... He was much older, he was in his 50s when he was... Older? Him. Okay, yeah, but yeah. at any rate, toward the end of his life, he said that his biggest distraction was actually sight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but this was... He was famous for his paradoxes. I yes, wouldn't trust him. <laughs> Don't trust him. Okay, so. now, would you like Adam to read the... Uh, a couple more poems, so would you like to ask some questions? So since the audience is small, we can sort of do what you would like us to do. Can I request that you read the poem that was published in the New Yorker? Uh, for, uh, that became adopted by uh, the attacks on uh, the Twin Towers. It became a memorial poem for that. Do you know what I'm talking about? About September the 11th. Uh huh. But what I, I didn't catch. It. That's the one that she would like you to read. Uh huh. So I read so it's a one. request. Yeah. Uh -huh. Do you have it in this or, collection? Of course, of course. Uh -huh. Good. It was actually found by Alice Quinn in this collection. That says, you know, interesting story how she found this poem because on the very day of. Uh, of 9/11, she was at in the morning. She was sitting in her apartment in New York, and she was going through the galleys. You know what the galleys are? Like when when the book is going to appear, the publisher sends out to different uh, magazines the galleys, which is like the pre-book. And she was then the poetry editor for the New Yorker. And she had the galleys of, of this part of this book without end, my selected poems. And then this horrible thing happened, and they had a meeting the very same afternoon uh, at, at the New Yorker, where they, um, the the editor in chief, um, 
uh, summoned all the editors to discuss what to do, what the New Yorker should do as an answer to this catastrophe, to this tragedy. And, uh, and so he asked her as a poetry editor, so do you have a poem? We need one poem which would somehow talk to this situation. And she, she told me that then she didn't remember. I said, I, I don't think so, I don't know. And she went back home and she went again to the galleries and then she, she f so it's a, it's a very strange coincidence. You know. Try to praise the mutilated world. Try to praise the mutilated world. Remember June's long days and wild strawberries, drops of rosé wine the nettles that methodically overgrow the abandoned homesteads of exiles. You must praise the mutilated world. You watched the stylish yachts and ships. One of them had a long trip ahead of it, while salty oblivion awaited others. You've seen the refugees going nowhere. You've heard the executioners sing joyfully. You should praise the mutilated world. Remember the moments when we were together in a white room and the curtain fluttered. Return in thought to the concert where music flirted. You gathered ac acorns in the park in autumn and leaves added over the earth's scars. Praise the mutilated world and the gray feather a thrush lost and the gentle light that strays and vanishes and returns. Maybe that's the moment to... Yeah, I think this will be a wonderful way of closing. Thank you, Adam. Thank you for Thank you. coming to St. Cloud. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much.